Hello, everyone. Today, I have two experts with me. First, Claudia Cardona, a medical oncologist practicing at the National Cancer Institute in Naples, Italy. Claudia is a gastrointestinal cancer specialist and also a member of the Young Oncologies Committee at ASMO. Furthermore, we have Professor Andres Cervantes, who is a professor of medicine and head of oncology at University of Valencia and ESMO's president-elect. My name is Benedict Westphalen. I'm a medical oncologist and molecular oncologist specializing in gastrointestinal cancers at University of Munich. Today, we would like to discuss abstracts considering real-world data in gastrointestinal cancers. I'm happy to have both of you here. The first question goes to Claudia. Claudia, what can we see from the real world data from the four abstracts presented at World GI 2021? Good morning and thank you, Ben, for your nice introduction. So the following abstract presented at World GI 2021 use real world data to address specific questions related to large scale toxicity, special population, treatment strategies, or feces and preferences. And these are relevant topics, usually not addressed by randomized trial, which anyway remain the best way to test hypotheses and to perform good clinical research. The first abstract includes data from an international prospective observational trial who evaluate the impact on quality of life and safety of Forfiri plus Aflibercept in more than 1,000 patients with metastatic colorectal cancer. This study included 24% of elderly patients and confirmed the known safety profile and activity of this treatment, irrespective of RAS status, prior treatment, and age. The second one is an international retrospective study assessing treatment strategies and related outcomes in more than 6,000 patients with pancreatic cancer. In this large-scale real-life study, Gemma Braxen, followed by fluoropyrimidine and modified fulfirinox, followed either by gemcetabine alone or in combination, were the most used strategies. And the presence of liver or lung metastasis, that performance status, high tumor markers were associated with worse prognosis. The third one is an international survey conducted in three months and involving more than 200 physicians treating patients with metastatic colorectal cancer. And this study offered a very nice snapshot of practice patterns in third life setting during COVID times. And according to the survey, the treatment goal remained similar to pre-COVID era to preserve quality of life and to prolong survival. And it was registered an increase in oral prescription and a shift toward consultation and telemedicine. The last one is a multicentric retrospective study describing the safety and the efficacy of perioperative treatment with FLOT in patients with gastric cancer according to age. And in this retrospective analysis, perioperative FLOT was safe in elderly patients. And however, personalized dose adjustments were often required and did not impair treatment efficacy. And authors suggest that further studies are required to confirm these results. Um, what do you think, Ben? What does it mean for gastrointestinal malignancy in general? Yeah, thank you, Claudia. I believe that real-world data is slowly coming of age. A couple of years ago, we thought that we can solve all the questions that cannot be solved, as you rightly pointed out, with real-world data, and quickly realized that when relying on such data sources, we need to um, provide good quality to answer relevant questions. And with these large-scale studies that you um, rightly cited, we now have high quality data that helps us close knowledge gaps as pointed out in elderly patients or in understudied populations that we do not see in um, clinical trials. And I think in terms of substituting what we've learned from clinical trials will allow us as treating physicians to be more comfortable in treating um, understudied populations and also help us to generate hypotheses for future clinical trials. 
if you know from your clinical practice that it's safe to treat elderly patients, for example, um, with the regimens that you um, mentioned, it is going to be possible to design um, clinical trials in these special subpopulations uh, um, to gain even more evidence, maybe even in a randomized um, trial. So hypo uh, hypothesis generation is very important. Andres, um, what do you think? What are the challenges facing real world data usage moving forward into the future? As you both uh, said, it's uh, very important that we take into account uh, real world data because less than 2% uh, of uh, patients go into clinical trials. So uh, in clinical trials, we have a limitation in the external validation because uh, our evidence-based uh, approach is really based upon a very low uh, number of patients, although uh, uh, very well selected in a very uh, conventional and very well-designed methodology. So traditionally, um, real world data did uh, provide a lot of uh, information on pharmacovigilance. So after approving uh, a drug, we can complement and improve the safety profile uh, through uh, uh, pharmacovigilance, which is uh, uh, much easier if we do it through this type of, of uh, real world data. But also uh, we have some, some limitations. Those limitations are related with the number of bias that we introduce without being aware on uh, the real world evidence. So I think uh, there are quite a lot of uh, uh, studies, quite a lot of uh, methodologies that are um, under development and at this moment accepted, for example, by some regulatory agencies like FDA to try to complement or to improve our knowledge uh, derived from randomized clinical trials uh, through a real world data. So a lot of new things is expected from this methodology. And, and I think we should be aware that even for hypothesis generating and for really uh, proving in practice, some of the advances we can uh, get through small randomized trials, real uh, world evidence uh, is coming to stay with us and to guide our future clinical practice.